Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today, we're going to talk about rogue traders. Because we hear a lot about them, but what are rogue traders actually? What do they do? Why do they do it? And why have they been given so much freedom in an Imperium that is, by some heretical minds, occasionally described as mildly oppressive? Well, that is quite the free-range question, and it is not always even necessary to ask, as, in fact, many rogue traders are not imbued with quite the same degree of freedoms as we are often told. These nuances and more, of course, we will talk about in today's video. But first, a word from our sponsor, Starforged who's got some neat license to 40k goods to show off. They've got a wide range of quality products like purity seals, with motifs from Space Marine chapters, the Inquisition, and more. Starforged also offers necklaces in honor of the Lion's Return, in silver or inlaid with gold. And since again it is all officially licensed merchandise from Games Workshop, you can be assured of the quality. So do check these items out and more by clicking the links in the description down below. And now, on with the lore. Let us begin then with the very fundament for the rogue trader's freedom, the Warrant of Trade. The Warrant is, despite the often overblown depictions of them, more often than not a simple piece of paper, signed by someone with an enormous amount of authority. Back in the good old days of the Great Crusade, the Warrants of Trade were issued and signed by the God Emperor himself, although he was just the Emperor back then. Many, if indeed maybe perhaps even most, of the Warrants of Trade still outstanding in the Imperium today still bear the Emperor's signature, but others have been created and signed after his enthronement upon the Golden Throne. These most often bear the signature of either a Primarch, or, if they are a later version, one of the High Lords of Terra. Though their authority remains the same, as even if the warrant was signed by a measly Primarch or a mere High Lord, they are signed in the name of the Emperor, giving the warrant authority only matched by the God Emperor's now, Most Holy Inquisition, as its power stems directly from Big E. That is why it has the authority to grant the liberties that it does, though, on the note on those liberties, many of you probably view the rogue traders as uh, mavericks that can go anywhere, do anything, and own anything. Well, that is true in some cases, but not in all. Some rogue traders do have carte blanche to go anywhere and do whatever the hell they please, but many others are bound by certain obligations, either to planets or sectors, for example, um, making sure that a hive world always has access to food stuff, for example, that might be one restriction, or their warrant of trade might only be good within a certain sector or larger area of space, or they may be required to effectively govern an imperial area, or they might be required to actively extend the Imperium's borders by delving beyond those borders to find new habitable planets, etc, etc. So it's not all privileges. These powers are granted for a reason, and the original rogue traders were created primarily to encourage expansion and exploration, to make people venture into the great unknown, risking life, limb, and fortune to find new worlds for the Imperium to conquer. Whereas today, the warrants of trades are usually made with a specific idea in mind, and most of them are more or less unique, though all of them will grant again substantial privileges to the person bearing one. And perhaps most importantly of all, a warrant of trade is permanent, as in it is hereditary. So long as the line of rogue traders remain intact, and that line can be 
broad indeed, as any and all descendants sharing a blood link to the original rogue trader could potentially be viewed as an heir of the warrant of trade, meaning that once issued, they very rarely, if ever, actually fall out of power. However, there is a lesser version of the Warrant of Trade called a Letter of Mark. Not to be mistaken for our own Terran historical equivalents, mind you, as those were issued by governments back in the Age of Sail, essentially empowering privateers, private persons, or pirates if you'd like, to attack enemy ships and steal whatever was on them. The 40k version of a letter of Mark is nothing quite so specific, as in theory it can contain within it all the powers and privileges of a full warrant of trade, though usually they are quite a bit more limited, tying the owner to a specific sector, area of space, task or undertaking. Crucially, the letters of Mark are not hereditary which also reflects the fact that they are intended to be a one-off thing, a mission granted to a high-standing person of the Imperium to do a certain task, and once that is completed, the letter will simply be allowed to expire with the death of its holder, though it is possible to petition for an extension of a letter of Mark, theoretically again, indefinitely but usually only until the completion of the task as, of course, some of the more ambitious undertakings could take several generations. And let us talk about these undertakings, shall we? These requirements that may be hoisted upon a rogue trader. What sorts of service might be worthy of granting someone access to damn near infinite wealth, and owning private warships and private armies and, well, private planets in some cases? There are actually a fair few. As mentioned, one of the initial users for rogue traders were as advanced scouts and explorers. Now, in the 41st millennium, the vast majority of the galaxy has been explored seven times over, and has been sufficiently mapped to the point where any astropath worth his salt can pretty much navigate it in his sleep. But. The galaxy is of course a very large place, and even to this date, there remain areas that are essentially unexplored. There are yet further areas which have lapsed into a state of unknowability, shall we say, due to either the collapse of imperial rule many thousands of years ago, the migration of some hostile alien species, or simply natural disasters. It's hardly uncommon, for example, for entire areas of the galaxy to be engulfed in warp storms that can last for hundreds if not thousands of years, and when they eventually abate, the rogue traders are usually the first one back into that area of space to see what, if anything, remains. These explorative duties also come with secondary and tertiary concerns as well, because obviously the exploration in and of itself is incredibly valuable. Finding a new habitable planet, for example, which will then usually, depending again upon the warrant of trade, be given over to the purview and the care of the rogue trader is an enormous thing. It's an entire new planet. It can provide food, raw resources, habitable areas for civilian populace, future recruits for the Imperial Guard, and so on and so on. Planets are unsurprisingly very valuable. And hell, it doesn't even have to be a planet. Even discovering a new asteroid belt rich in minerals, for example, or spinning dead worlds rich in promethium, or unique metals required for the forging of high-tech pieces like plasma focusing rings. All manners of stuff is out there in the galaxy, but compared to the sheer scale of it, they are nothing but specks of dust in an ocean. Which is again why you need a lot of people looking for things, and looking for things brings us to the secondary and the tertiary concerns as well, as in many cases there's a lot of stuff out there that has simply been lost. With the ever coveted STC technology, standard template constructs being the holy grail of these discoveries, lost marvels of technology that will turn a beggar into a planetary governor like that. 
And even if it isn't the Holy Grail itself, even individual lost pieces of technology, even literally individual examples of lost pieces of technology, like a, a hover bike or a knife or a weird plasma rifle, could be worth incredible amounts to the correct people, Adeptus Mechanicus usually, as remember, these are supposed to be Imperial servants. And even if you can't find technology, well, there are other valuable things out there in the galaxy. Like, for example, alien species that aren't immediately hostile to the Imperium. Uh, of course, the Imperium's official stance is that all Xenos must be eradicated, but sometimes the Xeno species might be worth more alive, and frankly, the Imperial Guard and Navy have better things to do than nuking savages from orbit. Sometimes it's simply easier to establish relations with them. And since the Imperium can't technically do this officially, well, rogue traders can do it without dragging the Imperium down into the, the dirty, filthy mud of non-human interaction. The rogue trader's ability to go wherever he wants can also be of great use to Imperial officials. I mentioned previously, for example, that they might be bound to making sure that a hive world has sufficient food. Well, that is one use, as emergency suppliers. Now, obviously, the Imperium would prefer to take care of its logistic itself, as that's nice and predictable, but the Imperium is very, very large, and pretty much all of the resources produced within the Imperium, food, metals, weapons, power packs, they're all already spoken for. Forge worlds will usually have orders backed up for decades, planned centuries in advance, potentially. A agri world will be producing so and so much food to supply so and so much in the way of demand. Is sudden fluctuation in this enormous scheme, covering trillions upon trillions of people, <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't work very well. It really doesn't. And so if somebody needs something out of the ordinary right now, well, often rogue traders are the only ones capable of supplying it, as they're the only ones with access to warp capable of ships that can react comparatively swiftly. Bearing in mind again, the usual merchantmen of the Imperium are non-void capable ships, at least in quote-unquote, close quarters travel. But you have ships carrying billions of tons of grain, for example, moving with real space engines on routes that can take decades, if not more, and they've simply planned that long ahead. Meaning, yet again, that any disruption in the flow of logistical supplies will have dire and far-reaching consequences. Obviously, the aid of a rogue trader in this manner comes at significant cost, but in essence, they fulfill the role of a sort of pseudo kind of black market, but on a galactic rather than local or planetary scale. Other services they might provide also includes a bit of a throwback to the letter of Mark, as some rogue traders are, in essence, legitimized pirates. See, on occasion, you might want to be stealing somebody else's stuff, but you can't actually be seen stealing their stuff because that would endanger your relationship. But you really, really want what they have, and so you will be satisfied with just a little bit of deniability, so long as you can have their stuff. And in this case, rogue traders and privateers are excellent alternatives because, well, Technically, you didn't get that man to steal that other person's stuff. He just so happens to have a, you know, document from you saying that he's allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> what can you do? Now, obviously, in the 41st millennium, with the Imperium being what it is, that is, in most cases, not a concern. You're not going to be overly worried about what a bunch of babbling Xenos are thinking of you, or Chaos Cultists, for that matter. But there are still, as mentioned, areas within the Imperium where there exists a sort of live-and-let-live attitude where rogue traders might provide both themselves and the Imperium with access to all manners of valuables that they just find you know, scattered around. 
It just so happens that a bunch of valuables were flying through space, and they just so happened to be inside of a ship that you were allowed to board. <laughs> what are the odds? In certain other instances, they might also be granted these more uh, piratical warrants specifically to aid in an ongoing war. A rogue trader being completely free from the overall imperial command structure can potentially wreck a lot more havoc behind enemy lines without straining imperial supply systems than squadrons of imperial warships. This would usually again be the remit of a letter of mark rather than a full warrant of trade, as it usually wouldn't, well, warrant a warrant of trade. But again, that is a theoretical possibility, and there are those who have been granted letters of mark specifically for their military actions. Indeed, one of the earliest mentioned rogue traders, Jan van Vastubal, was awarded one for a single-minded intent to bludgeon to death anyone who had ever wronged him. <laughs> and apparently a lot of people had insulted him over the years, as he went on a murder hobo campaign of epic proportions, eventually turning into just pretty much straight up a pirate. Fortunately for the Imperium, most rogue traders aren't quite that rambunctious, as the majority, well, make a living by trading. <laughs> I know. Shocker, right. Though the scale and the nature of the trade can vary quite greatly. Some rogue traders well established might even have access to entire planets and trade fleets, so that they themselves don't really necessarily need to be engaging in the trade, rather they've already set up the logistical systems, moving grain from one world to another, moving machine parts from this planet to that planet, mining resources out of that asteroid and shipping off to that forge world and so on. But not all rogue traders are quite that entrenched. As, once more, variation is really the key word here. There are rogue traders that are, well, ridiculously wealthy by any normal standards, owning entire warships and vast quantities of weapons and treasure, but compared to the truly established rogue trader dynasties that can control entire sectors, well, they're relatively poor, I suppose, relatively speaking. These more, uh, Rogue, rogue traders, if you will excuse the pun, usually earn their living trading unusual artifacts that only they can trade. Because here's the thing, of course. If you are operating within an already established imperial sector, then there will already be established trade lanes. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. The hive city needs food regardless of whether or not there is a rogue trader to fulfill the demand. The forge world still needs metal, and the wheels need to keep turning. However, that is of course not always the case if you go outside Imperial space, or if you are trading in something not necessarily strictly legal within Imperial space. Uh, we mentioned earlier like emergencies, like requiring emergency food or emergency supplies, and that is of course one thing, but stability is uh, supposed to be what the Imperium is aiming for, at least in the food deliveries one would hope. And so, the easiest way to earn a quick buck is to find something that isn't readily available. Now this could be something relatively easy and relatively legal, like um, delicacies. The overwhelming majority of food imports, for example, is going to be grain, gruel, uh, basic foodstuffs to satisfy the billions of people living on a planet. Whereas the upper classes, of course, they want something a bit more special. Grox is for the masses, flavorless, tough meat. But the highborn spire lords require far more tender produce. Now surely they can simply just buy this at the local supermarket, right? And sometimes they can, but overall the Imperium produces relatively little in the way of luxury goods. For the simple reason that if 5 billion people are about to run out of food, you have more pressing concerns than veal.
And so the rogue traders frequently have to go pretty damn far out of their way to acquire the sort of special produce that the upper spire nobles will be willing to pay a small fortune for. This is also a field in which nobody else can really compete overly easily. As previously mentioned, the majority of the Imperium's trade functions on a non-warp basis, because there just ain't enough astropaths to keep all of the merchant ships running to carry the enormous tonnage required. And so a rogue trader that does have access to a warp capable vessel can travel far more quickly and far further while still carrying a hefty quantity of goods. As even a small rogue trader ship, small like, you know, a frigate or something, still has the capacity to carry thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tons of cargo. That's a lot of veal. And in many cases, the desires of the upper class are not quite so simple either. In some cases, they might want exotic narcotics that only grows in certain areas of the galaxy, or more correctly, are only cultivated there. They might want weird memorabilia like... Xenos weaponry, for example, again, not strictly legal. They might want all manners of things that the Imperium might not want them having, but don't really care about enough to stop as there is a very large grey area there. By and large, Imperial nobles are allowed to do whatever the hell they want, so long as they manage to keep their planet under control. Rogue traders are given the same privilege, but to an even greater degree, as really only the Inquisition could even hope of policing the rogue traders effectively as they are far beyond the capabilities of the Adeptus Arbites by simple virtue of having a warp-capable spaceship. Furthermore, the reality is that, okay, so your nobles are indulging in some naughty business. Are, are they happy? Yes. Are they keeping their people under control? Yes. Well, <laughs> we've got more pressing matters to care about. And so this illicit and yet tacitly approved of trade brings in quite the pretty penny for the few people actually capable of delivering the goods. Rogue traders that have been around for a little while will undoubtedly begin to work out routes so that they can move from one area to the other, picking up the various goods they need to sell at the next station, and so on and so on, setting up a bit of a circular trade system, where they will eventually return back at the beginning with the valuable goods that those nobles needs in trade for yet further tonnage of other quality goods that somebody else further down the line wants. As this cash flow increases, the rogue trader is then likely to start expanding into more adventurous undertaking. Since again, there is no real limit on a rogue trader's freedom in, you know, certain cases, depending again on the warden trade, blah blah blah, they might as well build themselves a small fleet. Why should they do this trade circuit all the time, eh? When they could simply hire somebody else to do it. Why should they worry about needing to find the goods? Why not just simply buy the company that produces it? There you go. You'll always have your wares ready for your arrival. Maybe it'll be even more lucrative, in fact, if the rogue trader dedicates his time and his ship to the even more exotic things. Holographic jewellery only produced on a single planet in the galaxy. Or magical space-faring fishes that are a delicacy over on that world over yonder. Or depending upon the particulars of their warrant of trade, they might need to break off their mercantile business for a while to carry out their various obligations. Yet other rogue traders, of course, couldn't give two craps about the whole trade business. Others might even be entirely warlike, although they are rarer as the entire point of the warrant of trade is to imbue the individual with a degree of flexibility. But there are occasions in which rogue traders are created, well, literally to go and 
find new worlds to conquer, or even with the specific purpose of conquering a new planet. If the Imperium itself is too busy, too overstretched, or simply doesn't have the capacity to undertake a campaign of the appropriate size. Then somebody with a massive enough bank account might be asked to do it instead, bankrolling the entire operation in return for the promise that they will be able to keep whatever they is they have claimed. As we should of course probably also talk about how one becomes a rogue trader. Well, there isn't really any sort of a recipe here, really, as warrants of trade, particularly in the modern day Imperium, are issued exceptionally rarely. And even when they are issued, they're usually with far more limited powers than the good old ones handed down by the Emperor himself. But generally speaking, only the most driven, determined, and ambitious individuals will ever have even the slightest hint of a hope of obtaining a warrant, as you need to prove yourself so incredibly valuable to the Imperium that they will take the shackles off, and then trust you, and this is a big point too, trust you to run off and not overly abuse your powers, as of course a rogue trader with the ability to keep his own ship, his own fleet, his own personal army essentially, um, if they start going rogue, oh boy could they cause a lot of damage before anyone knows what's happening. Imagine for example a major established rogue trader dynasty, with contracts to deliver food to dozens of worlds. If he decides to go uh, proper rogue and lace the food with, oh I don't know, some sort of Nurgle virus for example, <laughs> hmm. You've, uh, you've got a rather sizable problem on your hand, as the rogue trader empire turns into a far uh, greener and less healthy looking imitation of itself. That could prove a very large problem. You're also going to be able to find somebody actually capable of issuing a warrant. And since they're, well, <laughs> there's more Primarchs waffling around every day now I suppose, so that makes it easier. But otherwise, your only reliable source of one is the High Lords of Terra, and they're busy individuals, difficult to convince of the need to grant anybody else exceptional powers. As well, becoming a High Lord too requires a rather ambitious individual who usually doesn't like sharing. There is of course one way to um, acquire approval, however, uh, a large enough bribe. An oldie but a goldie, though it is a reliable one, at least to a certain extent, as enough money greasing the right palms usually produce the desired result. There are even some cases where rogue traders are created because of the enormous amount of assets they have and the Imperium wanting to utilize them better. For example, in the establishment of a new trade empire, or the cracking of some particularly annoying mercantile guild. There are occasions in which areas of Imperial establishment gain a little bit too much power in an area, nobility gets a little bit too in entrenched, merchant classes get a little bit too comfortable in their roots and rotations etc, and start thinking that they can actually boss the Imperium around. Shameful I know. And one of the easier ways to get rid of these problems is to either introduce artificial competition in the form of a rogue trader, who has of course far more authority than they do, or potentially waving a warrant of trade in front of their noses and go okay okay. You built yourself quite the pretty little trade empire here, but you're kind of choking us on the prices of for grain, so could you perhaps just not? And instead, we'll give you this shiny thing and you can go off and earn money somewhere else. It could even be a good way of getting rid of annoying planetary leadership, you know, uh, the kind that starts to look at their planet and goes, hmm, maybe I could be independent. Well, sometimes it's simply easier to go, all right, fine, fine, but you're not getting the planet, okay? Here, have this, go find your own planet somewhere else. 
Indeed, there are even occasions where people with established military presences and forces will be given a warrant of trade and told to do just that, go find your own planet. Which kind of harkens back to the idea of explorers finding new worlds to settle for the Imperium. If that's going to be their mission anyways, uh, might as well outfit them to the point where they can actually establish their own private colony. Not like the Imperium cares if it's the property of a rogue trader, or if it's directly theirs, because after all, they gotta pay the Imperial tithe either way. Local rulership is something that the Imperium doesn't really care about all that often. And if indeed this new rogue trader dynasty is led by someone with sufficient drive, it might very well create its own little growth spurt within the Imperium, as it is not entirely unknown for rogue traders to create their own little mini Imperiums within the Imperium, even levying their own tithes of men and weapons and vehicles to service them in yet further conquests. There are those who have built entire kingdoms this way. This is also where one of the problems with the whole hereditary warrant of trade comes in. Many rogue traders are enamoured with the fruits of their own loins, of course, and will pass on their tremendous properties to their natural born children. This being the problem with most hereditary systems is that often the child is nowhere near as competent as the father. In fact, being raised in luxury often has a rather detrimental effect on one's capabilities, leading no doubt to the destruction of many rogue traded dynasties. There are others who recruit to the position essentially on merit as well. If the rogue traded dynasty is large enough, then entire segments of the extended family might be brought together as rogue traders elect sort of, where whomever is currently highest in the current rogue trader's favour is then allowed to take over the job after that rogue trader passes away. Some might even establish their own election systems, as who gets it is, well, again, one of those things the Imperium doesn't really care about. They just care about the fact that it is a hereditary title, and especially if they have access to vast quantities of resources that they don't simply just get wasted completely. Uh, particularly in the case, of course, of major planetary acquisitions. If a rogue traded dynasty controls a handful of worlds, and it ends up in the hands of some mouth-breathing moron, the Imperium might take issues with its mismanagement and um, rectify the situation the only way the Imperium knows how. And speaking of dealing with a rogue trader, because of course that occasionally becomes an issue as well, there are not that many institutions within the Imperium capable of actually bringing a rogue trader to heel, as again their authority stems directly from the Emperor. Now they could be a little bit roundabout around it, and send one rogue trader after another, essentially issuing a letter of mark on that particular rogue trader. But this is kind of like putting out a fire with fire. It can work, but um, putting two mad dogs in the same cage and hoping the correct one comes out on top is hardly the most subtle of strategies. Another, slightly more nuanced way, might be to try and find some way for them to forfeit their warrant of trade. Usually this would come in the form of finding them in violation or breach of some sort of requirement within it, like a um, customary stop at a planet, or the requirement to pay a certain tithe. But in the case of some rogue traders that basically don't have any of these limitations, it can get very difficult. And in those cases, your only real option is to find them in violation of something far broader, actual imperial tenets. In other words, you sick the Inquisition on them. This might require some manoeuvring in and of itself, because, you know, the Inquisition is busy too, but a rogue trader is a mighty big prey, and considering the aforementioned danger that one might pose to the Imperium if he gets any frisky thoughts about independence or worshipping certain unsanctioned deities, then yeah, an Inquisitor is likely to take a vested interest in whether or not he's playing by the rules. And there's the funny part. 
Because of course most rogue traders don't play by the rules. By definition, practically, as they have by and large been absorbed of the rules. But, uh, well, that absolution comes from the same source of authority as the Inquisition's source. And yet the Inquisition's authority, of course, supersedes all others. Basically, what you're doing might be legal to everybody else, but it might not be legal in the eyes of the Inquisition. The only police force that supersedes a rogue trader's own power. And the Inquisition can catch them. They have war capable ships of their own. They have acolytes. They have armies if needed. Fleets if necessary. They are one of very few forces within the Imperium capable of accurately investigating and bringing to heel a rogue trader should he prove uncooperative. For whilst a rogue trader may of course draw upon his own resources, his own finances, his own worlds, his own armories, his own shipyards, etc., the Inquisition can draw upon all of those things, but on the scale of the entire Imperium. Compared to an Inquisitor, even the wealthiest of rogue trader is nothing more than a pauper by the side of the road. Carrying a larger stick than your average beggar, sure, but a stick and a beggar nevertheless. And again, with the whole, you know, being above the law thing, most rogue traders have racked up an impressive amount of violations of standard imperial code. Dealing with Xeno species, well, that's technically a no-no. Finding Xeno's artifacts, weaponry, mayhaps even cavorting with Xenos creatures, big no-no, very large no-no. And who knows what manner of sorceress entities they could have been associated with. Now, granted, most rogue traders are relatively pious, as again, you're not going to be giving this sort of power to someone you don't have a decent amount of trust in. In fact, there are even certain rogue traders that are created specifically to spread the gospel of the Imperium. Ministorum rogue traders dispatched on crusades of the more spiritual variety rather than the Lansgun one, although the one does tend to flow into the other in the 41st millennium. But a few thousand years above the humdrum of everyday life, well, you might be forgetting your prayers here and there. Now, the violations can vary in severity quite a bit. Uh, you know, owning a Xenos weapon or two is going to be a relatively slim basis for wiping out an entire rogue trader dynasty, although feasible. But there are those who have been dispatched to the fringes of the Imperium, for example, to carry out conquests on various worlds. In many cases, they're not going to have the necessary military might at their immediate disposal. And rather than spending the next hundred, 200 years building it up slowly in other worlds, there are rogue traders that have resorted to hiring mercenaries of a non-human origin. There are even those who have created their own private armies de facto of all things greenskins. You see, despite the whole, you know, violent rampages across Imperial space nonsense, Greenskins are actually rather fond of humans because they tend to give them a good fight whenever the two end up clashing. And that, well, is the only thing the Greenskins really care about. So if a Humi comes to them, offering them all manners of resources, fancy weaponry, and perhaps most importantly of all, non-stop combat, they're likely to be tempted. And considering they have no real usage for imperial currency, you can literally get away with paying them in glass beads and fisticuffs. Cheap though it may be, however, the Inquisition will naturally not be overly enthused by such uh, business dealings. And hey, even if they can't find something on the rogue trader himself, well, if they're running an empire, I'm sure they can find someone guilty of something somewhere and then just go, well, is your responsibility, so I'm guessing we're gonna have to burn you all to the ground.
though they are going to need a fairly compelling reason in most cases. Well, unless they've been literally directed to take down the rogue trader, of course, but by and large the Inquisition view rogue traders as incredibly valuable pawns. Most truly successful Inquisitors will have at least one or two in their pockets, as the rogue trader provides them with something that is very rare in the Imperium, the ability to travel anywhere and melt into the background. There's not a whole lot of, uh, you know, sets of company that allows an Inquisitor to remain anonymous, but an enormous giga chance sailing around on a floating palace whilst wearing clothes the equivalent cost and value of an entire continent's GDP? Well, <laughs> you might actually be able to hide in that sort of company. Plus, the rogue traders again don't need to play by the usual rules. They don't need to log their visits and whenever they arrive, it's to great pomp and ceremony, providing yet further opportunities for a wily inquisitor to sneak on in unnoticed. The rogue traders are also able to provide services that nobody else can without calling on the services of the actual arms of the Imperium. You need reinforcements in an area, but you don't want to mobilize the guard, because that's going to get pretty obvious pretty quickly. Well, a rogue trader is likely to have a whole heck of a lot of naval armsmen, some even commanding entire actual standing armies, complete with landing equipment and spaceships. And on the Void side of things, well, if you thought that mobilizing the Imperial Guard was going to raise an eyebrow or two, try requisitioning flotillas of Imperial Navy warships. Yeah, if you've got any hope of any sort of, you know, undercover investigation, you're going to need something non-official. And especially considering rogue traders usually operate within set areas, their coming and goings will pretty much end up being relative routine where their arrival will make the minimum amount of disturbance in the local area. At least in comparison to, you know, Imperial Navy warships laden with Imperial Guard heaving into orbit that, uh, that tends to ruffle a few feathers. The rogue traders are also incredibly useful for their ability to uh, gain access to certain items that may not, strictly speaking, be entirely within the codified regulations of the Imperium. Again, the Inquisition doesn't necessarily care, even if a rogue trader is blatantly engaging in dealings with Xenos entities, so long as he isn't doing it maliciously. Now, that isn't every Inquisitor, there are a fair few Puritans in the ranks as well, but as we've seen covering the Inquisition so far, with the Plutonians being a particular standout example, there are many Inquisitors that have a very flexible interpretation of Imperial law. And hey, getting access to Xenos weaponry, Xenos equipment, or even straight up Xenos advisors can prove invaluable. Imagine, for example, gaining the services of an Eldar spy master, or orcs as shock assault troops with a great degree of deniability. I can easily imagine a scenario. Imagine that you have suspicions of local imperial nobility. They've got mining stations and outposts all over the system, but if you raid one of them, well, they own everything nearby. If you try to use local law enforcement, they're going to get tipped off. And if you start recruiting outside help on the scale necessary, like straight up Imperial Guard forces again, they're going to hide, obviously, because they know you're coming for them. But a random raid by orc pirates that just happens to destroy one of their orbital yachts, for example, well, <laughs> why would they possibly imagine that the Imperium would be involved in that? Again, it's going to require a Inquisitor with a somewhat flexible moral compass, but it is one possible usage of non-human assets. For these reasons and many more, the Inquisition prefers to make allies out of the rogue traders rather than enemies, but uh, sometimes the poisoned fruit has to be removed from the basket, no matter how much you'd might like not to. 
and in the case where dealing with the dynasty is absolutely necessary, the Inquisition will probably prefer assassination. At the very least, that should be the first remedy, as, well, this is the problem with a dynasty centered around essentially one head figure. If he's the problem, and he dies due to you know, orc snipers or something like that, then, well, problem solved. Hopefully, the next head of the dynasty is more aware of the expectations that the wider Imperium places upon his shoulders, shall we say. If a larger portion of the dynasty is corrupted, you might need a full purge of the upper leadership, but considering the sheer size of a rogue trader dynasty, you are unlikely to need to kill all of it. Hopefully, anyways. If they've actually come to the point where they've mobilized their resources in active collaboration with Chaos, for example, well, Outright large-scale warfare is going to be the only option, which you really want to avoid. Not only is it going to take absolute ages, but it is going to be ruinously expensive. As any rogue trader ballsy enough to try to go for independence or straight-up heretical nonsense, is going to have built up a significant military force. Unless he is thoroughly suicidal, in which case he might decide to have a go at it with a ship or two, but, uh, well, very few rogue traders reach their lofty position whilst also being incapable of breathing and walking at the same time. And yet, one must of course consider that the biggest treasure that any rogue trader has is his freedom. He is greater than virtually any other Imperial servant's freedom. His freedom to go anywhere, to do anything, to trade with anyone and with anything. And if absolute freedom, or as near to it as you can get without being a Lord Inquisitor, is your goal, is your ambition, is the reason why you clawed your way to the absolute top of the 41st Millennium's food chain, then, well... Shouldn't we be worried that they might decide to go for just a little bit more freedom, too? For power, as they say, corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Surely, freedom, in a galaxy where most people have none, would be a pretty much direct equivalent, no? Food for thought, anyways. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.